Ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to this uh, webinar about the new rules relating to uh, witness statements for trial in the business and property courts, which come into force next Tuesday for all cases, new and old, where witness statements have not yet been exchanged. Now, when I started the bar, there were no witness statements, and it was always said that the greatest art of the advocate was not his ability to cross-examine, but his ability to conduct a good examination in chief, by which he puts the witness at his ease, and then the witness tells uh, the truth in his own words. I have no doubt that that is why in the old days, but not now, appellate courts, when turning down uh, an appeal, used to say that the trial judge had had the opportunity to see the witness's demeanor. That is to say, as he gave his evidence in chief. That nowadays is something appeal courts do not rely on quite so much, and they disapprove of that. I think that is because we no longer have the practice of taking evidence in chief in court, at least in civil cases. I remember when the change came to the taking of wit of, uh, the, came, came when the change came in when written witness statements were provided in advance of trial. Uh, and the point of that was to enable uh, the parties to understand in advance what each other's case was and to prepare uh, for cross-examination. It was also to stop what used to happen sometimes, namely the witness in the old phrase did not come up to proof in giving his evidence in chief, at which point the whole case would collapse. However, the obvious problem with witness statements was that it became routine for lawyers to draft virtually every single word. And it got to the stage when no one in their right mind would pay all that much attention to what the witness statement said, because they were just what the lawyers had told the client to say, or the witness to say. And indeed, we've all come across cases where what the witness in the witness box says in a moment of difficulty is, can I have a look at my witness statement, please, as if that is going to help them out. Uh, and I think that is now why when you read judgments, Judges normally refer not to what the witness said in his uh, witness statement, uh, but at most to what he has said in cross-examination. Now, these new rules, which are coming into force, are a very important change, and they are motivated by a desire to get back so far as possible uh, to, A, the advantages of having an oral examination in chief, from which you can really see whether the witness is telling the truth in his own words, together with B, the advantages of enabling the other side to have proper notice of what the witness is going to say when he gets into the witness box. The idea of that is, is that settlement is easier and it then becomes easier to prepare an economical cross-examination. In short, the purpose of these new rules is to get the best of both worlds. Uh, whether in real life that is going to happen, uh, I am not so sure at all, but I shall hand over now to uh, Chris and Natasha so they can explain uh, what these new rules are all about. Thank you very much, Peter. Good, uh, good evening as well from, from me, and thank you very much for attending what is obviously a, a very beautiful day here, certainly in, in the South. Uh, just a few bit of pieces of housekeeping very briefly. We're, because of the nature of doing this over Zoom, we're going to take questions at the end. Uh, we, that's done they're obviously asking questions at any time through the chat function, and we'll, we'll have a look at them at the end. We're going to be about 40 minutes in terms of our presentation, so we'll leave definitely time for questions. I'm sure there will be some. Uh, the other thing is, uh, if you wish to have the slides uh, for this presentation afterwards, then please, I'll say this at the end again, email marketing at threehaircourt.com. And whether you do or not, uh, you'll be sent a link for all those of attending uh, with a, a video, this is being recorded, uh, so a video of this whole session. So without further ado, Leanne, if you could just share your screen and the presentation, please. Thank you. And if you just go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So Peter's obviously set out uh, stall as it were in terms of what the problem is but it's worth uh, setting out in what's one member of the judiciary albeit a deputy high court judge uh, like 
Peter himself. Uh, John Kimball has said in a, a relatively recent judgment of Cathay Pacific Airlines, I could have picked numerable cases for juicy quotes as to what the problem was being faced in the business and property courts, but I've settled on this one in part because John Kimball is also a member of the Witness Evidence Working Group, which is principally the reason why we have this new practice direction and appendix. So I'm not going to read out the whole quote there, but what essentially what he's saying there is that witness statements in the business and property courts, and indeed many other courts, often strain to argument and commentary on documents. And he quotes there from Sir Terence Sir Terence Atherton, who was the chance at the time in the case of J.D. Weatherspoons and Harris, uh, making much similar points. There are expressions of opinion and submissions, when of course, uh, as Peter says, that's not what the purpose of witness statements are designed to be. In paragraph six, he's talking there about uh, the fact that with an increase in the si size of the sums at stake, uh, it tends to be more problematic that witness statements contain submissions of uh, mission, submissions and argument. Um, it's not necessarily my experience that the sums and stake have to be significant for there to be these sort of problems in witness statements. But I think it's definitely fair to say that whatever the size or reputation of the law firm or the legal team involved, it's a fairly endemic problem across the board. So next slide, please. So why now? Well, I've mentioned the Business and Evidence Working Group. Um, that was formed some time ago and presented its final report in December uh, 2019. I think it's worth just setting out in paragraph one of that final report where this project's arisen from. And it, I quote, this project stemmed from an impression shared by a substantial majority of the judges of the commercial court that factual witness statements were often ineffective in performing their core function of achieving best evidence at proportionate cost in commercial court trials. An issue that was first raised, uh, certainly more than just ju uh, judges grumbling, in a meeting of the Commercial Court Users Committee in March 2018. So it has been going on for some time, the, the complaints. What it led to, uh, uh, going further from judicial grumblings, was a survey conducted, which many of you participating tonight may have um, taken part in, an online survey of practitioners of the commercial court. And just one fact worth, worth pointing out um, that the final report deals with was that only 6% of the participants thought the current system of witness statements fully achieved the aim of producing the best evidence possible. So not only clearly was it uh, a perception from judges that was a problem, it was participants, uh, solicitors and barristers, that there was also uh, widespread problems in the courts. So that led to a series of um, uh, further meetings and an impl implementation report done by the working group that was received by the Business and Property Courts Board in October of last year. That was then referred to almost wholesale. There's hardly any changes to the draft practice direction that the working group drafted and its appendix. That was presented to the CPR committee at its meeting in December. And of course, that's led to, as Peter says, the practice direction and appendix coming into force in a week's time, 6th of April. Next slide, please. So just gonna set out in brief what the purpose of the new regime is. Again, we've spoken about what the problem is, so that's really, it's designed to fix that problem. But it specifically says in paragraph 2.1 of the practice direction that witness statements are supposed to set out in writing the evidence in chief that a witness of fact would give if they're allowed to give oral evidence at trial without having provided the statement. And what it does is sets out uh, effectively mandatory best practice uh, that is aimed at avoiding presenting argument and commentary. And also it, it speaks at some length about um, the business of witness recollection of the fallibility of memory. And it aims to address that and for witnesses to be conscious of what they can and cannot give evidence about. And also imposes obligations, which will, will come onto in due course, on lawyers, legal representatives themselves, 
uh, in their role in the evidence gathering stage. So now I'm going to hand over to my colleague Natasha, who's going to speak on when the regime applies. Okay, um, so if we could just move over to the next slide, please. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. I must say I'm silently judging anyone who's inside watching this webinar rather than outside basking, probably with a gin and tonic in hand, but thank you for joining us nonetheless. Um, so I can see that a question has popped up in, the, up in the chat, and I'm just going to read that out first because the first point um, I'm going to be talking about, I hope, actually answers that question. So um, someone has asked, my client has been sued. Exchange of witness statements will take place later this year. I already have signed and dated the witness statements. The practice direction says that it applies to witness statements taken after a particular date, but the introduction to this session suggests that the test is when the litigation takes place. Do I have to redo the statements? Now, um, as you can see in the first bullet point there, um, the new practice direction um, will apply to all witness statements for claims issued from the 6th of April, 2021, or, and I hope this answers the question, um, in existing proceedings where witness statements are signed on or after this date, so this date being the 6th of April 2021. Um, but that second point there is one to bear in mind, particularly this week, if you are still in the throes of drafting any statements um, and you're not going to be able to get them signed before Tuesday, um, because then the practice direction will bite. Um, the next bullet point there uh, makes clear that trial is defined in paragraph 1.2 of the practice direction to mean a final hearing, whether of all issues or only one or some particular issues in proceedings in any of the business and property courts that are brought under, and then moving to the third bullet point there, CPR part seven or eight, or trials for unfair prejudice positions and just and equitable winding up petitions. So it's got a fairly extensive application. Um, I would encourage you to check paragraph 1.3 of the practice direction. Um, which sets out nine instances where the practice direction will not apply. And I think for this audience, the most relevant exclusions are likely to be those set out in the fourth bullet point on the slide there, namely applications under the Insolvency Act or insolvency rules um, and applications under the Companies Act, which are set out in um, practice direction 49A, section two. Um, I'll also note just before moving on to the next slide um, that it's worth taking a look at paragraph 1.1 of the practice direction as well because this makes clear that it doesn't apply to affidavit evidence, which obviously is central to a lot of proceedings um, that might take place in the business and property courts. Um, and it's do it doesn't apply to witness statements other than trial witness statements. Um, the new practice direction also has no impact on the general powers of the court under CPR 32.1, which are the court's powers to control, exclude or limit factual witness evidence. So if we could go on to the next slide, please. Okay, so we've tried to give you here an overview on this slide of what the new regime does before taking you through some of the nuts and bolts of the, the new practice direction. So firstly, um, you can see that witness statements now need to be prepared in accordance with the appendix, um, which is annexed to the practice direction, and any relevant court guides that, that would already exist. Now that's to be expected. Um, but it's important to note that the appendix needs to take precedence over any inconsistency with the relevant court guides. So this new regime is, is the one to go to um, if there's a discrepancy. Um, we've mentioned in this slide, really as an aid memoir, that the practice direction distinguishes between represented parties and litigants in person. Um, so if you are involved in litigating against a litigant in person, do remember to look closely at the practice direction, in particular at paragraphs 3.14 to 3.16 of the appendix. Um, and you'll note that most of the provisions do still apply, but you, you will need to check how they bite. Um, but we, we don't intend to talk too much about this in this presentation because obviously we know that um, we're talking mostly to an audience of legal representatives. The final bullet point there on the slide um, summarizes what the practice direction and appendixes set out, and the appendix set out. Um, firstly, when witness evidence is required. Secondly, the obligations on legal representatives in terms of explanation to clients and in terms of conducting the interview. That's obviously something we're gonna come on to talk about. Um, what statements should and more emphatically should not contain. And then at the bottom there, we've got the new confirmation of compliance and certificate of, of compliance requirements in the practice, direct, uh, in the practice direction. 
both of which are important new developments. And I think Chris is going to come on to talk uh, about those in the coming slides. Uh, so on to the next slide, please. And back over to Chris, I think. Thanks, Natasha. So I've titled this slide preparatory steps, and this is really uh, setting out initial steps to take at the beginning of a witness interview or at the time of sending out a witness questionnaire, or if a witness is in, essentially entirely drafting the witness statement themselves, then sending out uh, at the time instructions, um, which are very prescriptive and set out in paragraph 3.9 of the appendix. And they are a, a fourfold. One is the purpose of witness statements, and that is specifically spelt out at paragraphs 2.1 and 2.2 of the practice direction and paragraphs 2.3 to 2.6 of the appendix. Setting out, explaining the proper contents of witness statement, again, very prescriptive, that's set out at paragraphs 3.1 to 3.3 of the practice direction, and that's something that Natasha is going to be uh, speaking more about. Thirdly, the proper practice in relation to the preparation of a statement, again, set out specifically at paragraphs 3.2 to 3.7 of the appendix. And again, something Natasha and I was going to be speaking to in further slides. So it is very, very prescriptive. I've set out what um, I mentioned it before about the reliability of human memory. And it's worth, again, just repeating that I think the, it can be fair to say that the court's approach is sceptical, and that's something which a witness must appreciate. So in terms of thinking about purpose, proper content and proper practice, I think my, my view is it should at least become standard for witnesses to be provided with a copy of the practice direction and appendix and asked to read it or given an information sheet with the specific paragraphs going to these issues and for them to read and confirm they've understood it. It's even better, of course, um, in addition, if a interviewer reads out those paragraphs, but there is an element of course of reality and, and that, that becoming somewhat tedious. Um, but as I say, it's certainly expected this will be standard that, that witnesses will be expected to read and understand purpose, proper content and proper practice. And that is made good, if we can just go to the next slide, by what is now being asked to be done specifically in terms of not only signing a statement of truth by the witness, but also signing what's called a confirmation of compliance statement. And I, I, we've set it out there in, in full. I think that's important to, to do so to have a read because it's, it's coming back to setting out what uh, the fact that the witness understands what the statement is doing and what they're giving evidence on. And this includes setting out my own personal knowledge and recollection in my own words. And in my own words, it's again something we'll be coming on to in terms of drafting statements. But what I think this is clearly being done here is witness statements no longer containing hearsay such as I understand that, understand this to be the case, or understood this to be the case. Um, that is to be avoided uh, and not included. Uh, and only evidence that they can personally give uh, it to be included. And before just moving on, it's worth saying that in paragraph 4.2 of the appendix, so the next paragraph to this where it says the, sets out the confirmation of compliance, it says that any application for permission to vary or depart from the confirmation of compliance may be made and generally should be made without notice for determination without a hearing. So interestingly, to vary or depart from the language here, one has to make a without notice application for it to be determined on paper. And um, maybe something you come into in, in the Q&A, but my own view is what that is being, what's being uh, considered there is things like where evidence has to be given by hearsay because perhaps the, the primary evidence uh, giver of fact has died or is not available. And so there is some element of a, a witness saying, I understand this to be the case. Um, that's where one would make an application to vary this so that they can sign this statement with, with uh, some of the uh, declarations there uh, being removed. So not only does a witness have to sign a confirmation of compliance, but if they're legally represented or if the party's legally represented, the legal representative taking the statement also has to sign 
a, a sports notice, a certificate of compliance. So if we could turn to the next slide, please. That sent, sets out the, the language there in full. I'm not going to read it out, but it, it just again emphasizes the, the new duties uh, and the emphasis, emphasis on the new duties, of what legal representatives are expected to do. So I'm going to now turn over to Natasha, who's going to take us through the interview process. Hi again, everyone. Um, so over to the next slide, if that's OK. OK, so this slide relates to the interview of the witness by legal representatives for the purposes of producing a witness statement. Um, and what is and is not permissible at the interview um, is set out in some detail now in the appendix. Um, and I know from speaking to several solicitors already that the changes here are causing particular concern because there's quite a shake up on what can and, and more importantly cannot now be done. Um, so the intention behind these changes is to prevent statement takers from doing anything to alter or influence a witness's re recollection. Um, and that's set out in the second bullet point of the slide there. And I think the changes can be headlined as firstly controls on questioning and secondly controls on the use of documentation. So on to questioning first, um, the top bullet point on the slide shows that statement takers should use open questions where practicable. I'm just putting a little pin in there because this raises the question as to when it wouldn't be practicable. Um, and that leading questions should not be used on contentious matters. Now, the appendix defines leading questions at paragraph 1.2 to mean a question that expressly or by implication suggests a desired answer or puts words into the mouth or information into the mind of a witness. So, for example, if you are exploring with your client, um, your client's account on the orally agreed terms of a contract, um, you could ask, what did you understand the payment terms to be? Or when did you expect payment to be due, for example? But it would not be appropriate to ask, did you think you only had to pay upon delivery of the product? Um, so just a silly example there, but that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. Um, the second headline relates to the use of documents during the interview. And one of the main thrusts of the new practice direction, as we keep seeing, is to move away from witness statements acting as a narrative of the documents in the case. And the appendix tries to cut this practice off at the source here by providing that the only documents that can be shown to a client are those that the client created or saw at the relevant time. Um, so we'll see on the next slides that there are now requirements for the statement to set out um, documents that the witness has reference to. And um, sorry, if I could just go back to the previous slide, um, just for one final comment, I think, um, sorry, sorry about that. Um, the final point at the bottom of the slide there um, is that there is a requirement in the appendix that interviews be recorded fully and accurately, and that the interview is dated and retained by a legal representative. So that's a slightly more procedural point, but certainly one that does need to be borne in mind. Okay, now over to the next slide, if that's okay. Okay, so preparation and contents of statements. Um, the focus of the practice direction is to make witness evidence as concise as possible. And paragraph 2.1 of the practice direction sets out that, and I'm quoting here, the purpose of a trial witness statement is to set out in writing the evidence in chief that a witness of fact would give if they were allowed to give oral evidence at trial without having provided the statement. So in essence, it means that statements are to provide testimony on matters within the witness's personal knowledge, rather than serving as an opportunity <clears throat> for the witness to argue the case. Um, now, the first thing that struck me here is that this isn't necessarily a significant black letter move away from the provisions that are already contained in CPR 32.4, which describes a witness statement as a written statement signed by a person which contains the evidence which the person would be allowed to give orally. Um, and this also more or less actually reflects the, the wording in, for example, the um, Chancery Guide, which uh, guideline 19.2 essentially says exactly the same thing. Um, but again, with these reforms, we're thinking back to Mr. Kimball QC's comments um, in the Cathay Pacific case in the first slide, and the intentions behind the new practice direction to strip witness evidence back to testimony of fact and have a kind of mechanism to enforce that in the courts. Um, Finally, as foreshadowed, it is important to note the point at the bottom of the slide there, that paragraph 3.7 of the appendix specifically requires 
witnesses to state how well they recall events they speak of and record whether their memory has been refreshed by reference to documents. Um, so again, that's that same theme running throughout. Um, if we could just go over to the next slide. Thank you. Um, and, and you can see in the first bullet point here that that requirement also extends to providing a list of documents that the witness had reference to when preparing the statement. And that's a requirement that comes from paragraph 3.2 of the practice direction. Um, paragraph 3.2 specifically states as well, and this is worth noting that privilege is not affected by meeting this new requirement. Um, and that is something that is echoed more widely in paragraph 1.1 of the appendix, uh, which states nothing in this appendix removes or limits any privilege that would otherwise attach to documents generated by or for the purpose of obtaining evidence for use in litigation. So that's potentially something that will become relevant to those records of interviews, for example, that we, we talked about a few slides ago. Um, but otherwise, paragraph 3.4 of the appendix tightly constrains the circumstances under which documents should now be referred to in witness statements, limiting this to, and we're looking at the second bullet point here, um, what is necessary and required to prove or disprove the contents or provenance of a document, explain the witness's understanding at the relevant time, or confirm whether the witness saw the document at the time. So again, there at the bottom, we can see in paragraph 3.6 that the practice direction seeks to limit documents being narrated, commented upon, or inappropriately quoted from at length. So again, we're, we're back to the key theme that's running through everything. Okay, I think back over to Chris and probably over to the next slide. Thank you, Natasha. We've got some great questions coming on the chat, so we'll be uh, get to them as, as soon as possible. So on this one, this is, um, uh, we can see from the first bullet point there that what the slide's really doing is setting out what, uh, to the extent to which legal representatives can get involved in the drafting process. So they can assist a witness as to structure, layout or scope. So in other words, providing a template for the, for the witness or obviously formatting the type notes in, of an interview into some sort of structure, but obviously only to the extent that they act, accurately reflect the notes. And it says specifically at 3.10, this next bullet point, that legal representatives are encouraged to base statements on notes of an interview. And um, what the, the thread that's running through these paragraphs is very much that an interview will be taking place. Of course, I don't think this precludes at all a, a questionnaire being sent out. Um, but what, and this is, goes to the last bullet point, what any questions asked, be they in person, over Zoom, in emails, in questionnaires, none of those must be leading questions. So all open questions, who, what, where, how, when. The third bullet point is again important to bear in mind, it specifically says that preparation involved, should involve few drafts as possible, uh, such to avoid corrupting recollection through repeated revisions. So the, the common practice of iterative drafting will no longer be appropriate under the new rules. I think it's fair to say that uh, this appendix represents a significant step change in how statements are drafted uh, thus far. If we can go on to the next slide, please. So the sanctions, as well as the normal case management powers and sanctions available to the court, um, Natasha has already referenced them in relation to, to part 32. Um, paragraph 5.2 of the practice direction specifically sets out four further powers. Um, some of them are obviously crossover with existing powers in CPR, but one to refuse or to give or with draw permission to rely on or strike out parts of a trial witness statement, order that a witness statement um, be redrafted in accordance with the practice direction or as directed by the court, three, make an adverse cost order against the non-complying party, and four, order a witness to give some or all of their evidence in chief orally. I think it's fair to say that certainly one and two we envisage particularly being used uh, in relation to four, Whilst I think I'd love to see that uh, as an observer, evidence in chief being given orally, um, certainly something to be, of course, avoided um, in relation to your own witnesses. So that wraps up um, things. We're just going to hand over back to Peter for conclusion, and then we'll go on to uh, the, the questions that arrived in the chat function. So, Peter. 
Oh, I just have just a couple of points. And the most obvious point, which is a fairly broad point, which would occur, I think, to the layman more than perhaps to the lawyer, is how on earth is the court going to police all this? I mean, there are lawyers and lawyers. Uh, and some lawyers may be considerably more relaxed about following these rules than others. And so my gut feeling is, is that eventually everyone's going to descend to the lowest common denominator, because you don't want to lose clients, because you're, you're known as a terrible old stickler for these new rules that have been introduced. And after all, no one ever need know if you go a little bit, if you're a little bit more relaxed than other people. Uh, I, find this, I find this very disturbing. The other problem is, how on earth are the lawyers themselves supposed to deal with this? Um, what about the point about iterations of statements? I remember doing a case when I, we must have got at least a 15 iterations of a statement. Um, and that wasn't being encouraged by the lawyer. It was the client who kept fiddling around with it. Now, what do you suppose, and why can't they? After all, they might say that's not quite how I want to put it. And that's perfectly legitimate. What are you supposed to do at that point as the lawyer? Do you run off to court and say, well, I don't think I can uh, sign a, a statement of compliance as things stand, um, because my clients come up with 15 different iterations of this statement, and they're all a bit different, although he insists they're all just the same. Do you run off to court on an ex parte application? And if you do run off to court on the ex parte application, what do you have to tell the judge? On the face of it, you have the duty of full and frank disclosure. So if you give full and frank disclosure, what's the judge going to do? Is he going to say, well, I will let you uh, alter your statement of compliance, but there will be, obviously, you'll have to uh, mention the fact there have been 15 iterations of the statement. What if the other side then say, oh, well, we want to have a look at all of those. Are they to be treated as privileged or not? Uh, that seems to me to be uh, what essentially the nature of the problem. How is anyone in real life going to police this? Uh, and I think it is, I think it places a quite unfair burden uh, on uh, the statement takers. So take another example, supposing the client simply, as often they do, uh, appear to check or give inconsistent evidence, or they say two different things in the course of giving their statement. It may well be that they're not actually giving inconsistent evidence, but to what extent can you, so to speak, gently prod them in the right direction? You can't ask them leading questions. Uh, you, can't ask, you can't even take them to documents. Uh, which, on the face, uh, unless they're documents they saw at the time of the events in question, or which they themselves created. But that's going far further than the examination in chief ever did. You'll be perfectly entitled in examination in chief to put, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a subsequent document to a witness and say, well, what do you have to say about this? And with that, you might get in with any luck to come back to the right answer. Um, so those seem to me to be the obvious, uh, that seems to be the obvious nature of the problem. Far too, very difficult to police, far too much discretion to the lawyers, and how are they in real life supposed to deal with a difficult client? The other point is uh, this, if all this now takes place, there will obviously be no statement on the face of it setting out what all the documents say. And indeed, the witness is the idea, this is to reduce the witness statement to a considerable extent. That seems to me to have a knock-on effect, uh, namely that uh, openings at trial will have to be much longer. Uh, and actually, that may not be a bad thing, because it's got to an absurd stage now when judges get thrown the papers uh, with about a day or half a day to read them. They can never get on top of them on time. And then they're told there's going to be a half a day opening in what might be a six day, 10 day trial. I suspect, therefore, and this is quite an important practical point, that with this new regime, we will in future, when you go along asking for directions for the length of trial, uh, one important point might be to say, well, uh, we anticipate now that there, this trial will need two days for opening rather than just half a day. So the judge can be taken through the relevant documents. And certainly having sat as a judge, one rather likes that. Uh, so that may be uh, another consequential change, which to be frank, I don't think was actually thought about uh, by the uh, draftsman of these new rules. Um, so, th so those are my observations there. I, I think it's an attempt to get the best of both worlds. And I think like most attempts to get the best of both worlds, you, you get the worst of both worlds. So I, I'm rather pessimistic, although it may be that there may, it may be possible to tweak these rules a little uh, so as to get rid of some of the problems. Thank you, 
Peter, we, as I said, we've got some um, questions flying in left, right and centre. Um, I think Natasha um, answered the first one we got on the fly. I'm going to cheekily take the second one we've got because it's a very easy, quick one, which is does this, these, this new regime apply to other proceedings other than in the, uh, the BPT, BPC? Um, and even if it does not, is it good practice? I think the short answer is yes, it is good practice. We've, we've got a last slide which we, we might go to after the questions, which is other recommendations that the working group made. And I think it's fair to say that if these are proved to be successful, uh, or at least successful in part, notwithstanding Peter's uh, concerns, which I share, they will be rolled out wholesale. I think uh, we said at the very beginning of the slide, with what is the problem? The problem of witness statements becoming argumentative and containing submissions are not confined to, to BPC. And so I, I could see them being, ro being rolled out, but perhaps in an amended form, depending on how successful this practice direction proves to be. Okay, so we've got the next question. Um, I have a number of part seven claims for IPs. They will be at little purpose in them putting in witness statements now, it seems to me, since they have no first-hand knowledge of what happened. Up to now, the purpose of such statement was in many ways to get the relevant documents before the court in a logical fashion which will be cost saving, not least as it would shorten openings to introduce the document. Well, I think Peter's partly spoken to that issue, which is that openings are likely to be longer. Um, whether, as, to, as to whether there's any purpose in putting in the statements, well, if the, the I think it's fair to say, Peter and, and Natasha, if the, uh, the IP in this case, or a, a witness doesn't have any first-hand knowledge of the, of the matters, then it's going to be infringing what the appendix says specifically. Um, I mean, I think document handling is going to be quite different now with these changes and not only with longer openings, but I think longer cross-examination because the reality is a lot of documents will simply just be put in a bundle and no witnesses will be speaking to them. Because if they don't go to speaking, if they're, they're not about the authenticity of the document, or if there isn't some meaning which needs to be explained, such as shorthand or handwritten notes, um, then the witness is not really permitted to, to, to speak to them. So I, I see that reality is um, a lot of documentation is not going to be referenced in witness statements and is going to be simply put in bundles possibly also forming the basis of agreed statements of fact, which is something which, uh, again, the judiciary and the working group have been looking at, the agreed statements of fact becoming more important. Um, do you guys, do you have any other observations on this, whether? Yeah, um, I'd just come in because um, I think that's a really complete answer and it obviously builds on what um, Peter said um, about the role of opening. Um, I can just see there potentially being um, an opening for a sort of narrative of documents type document that may be something that is directed um, at a directions hearing stage, um, which would be separate to the witness evidence, but might serve a similar um, function, less commentary focused, but more as a kind of overview of the key documents in the case. And, um, and if it could be agreed between parties, then, then all the better, um, which, you know, is creating more documents but I can see that being the sort of thing that would be of assistance in claims like a part seven claim for an IP where the documents are key and without having an orienting witness statement um, from someone who is a professional in the case to kind of walk the judge through what's going on, then, um, then it would be quite a hard set of papers to come to blind for whoever's hearing that case. Um, I don't know if you had anything else to add, Peter. Well, I don't know. Presumably, I haven't, I haven't actually checked. Presumably there's something in the rules that says you can always apply to court uh, to be uh, exempted uh, from these rules. And I would have thought the example of the IP would be a rather good one. You'd say, well, I don't know any of this, but I've got a whole pile of documents which show the directors knew perfectly well they were stealing the money. And I want to put them in a convenient form before the court. And I'll just attach them to my witness statement and say what I, uh, uh, and set out in my statement what I say one gets from. I mean, I would have thought if actually, uh, I would have thought there must be a power in the court to allow uh, 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 an IP in that type of cir uh, circumstance, 
uh, to uh, put in a statement along those lines. It might be a statement where he wouldn't be allowed to argue too much, but I don't see why he wouldn't be allowed to say, these are the documents that uh, we've got, and uh, as far as we can make up, this is what they show, without perhaps banging on about it. It might be no, one I think of those, sorry. <laughs> Actually, I was just going to say that might be one of the, the situations where the compliance statement would, would be not appropriately attached at the end of the witness statement. Um, sorry, okay. Chris. But you'd no, have to do it in advance. I think that's the crucial point. You would go off to get, so you might have to be a little more conscious before the case management conference of what you actually need to get uh, by way of witness statement and indeed by, uh, by way of any exemption to the current rules. And that might be, you might find that becomes a standard feature of case management conferences. Well, I, I, I think there is going to be a, a body of case law that's going to be built up on paragraph uh, 4.2 of the appendix, which is what I covered, and which is applying, it says without notice, so I wonder if that's going to change um, to a court for a paper decision um, as to when a, the certificate of compliance mm. is going to be varied. And I think that that's clearly going to be tested very soon as to, to what extent um, that uh, statement of compliance is varied in circumstances such as this. Mm. And the next question is one on statements of compliance as well. So if I just read that out quickly, uh, would an example for seeking a variation of the legal representative certificate of compliance be where witness statements are being finalised based on a proof of evidence taken by former solicitors? So um, I don't know, Chris, are, are you best placed to, to take that one having addressed it on the slides? I mean, yes, I think is the, the short answer. Um, that, that That's probably an example um, which it is permissible. Again, we haven't got any a case law ready to build on, but I think if you can present, present a compelling case as to why this evidence is necessary to be before the court to determine central issues to the case, um, then there's clearly a, a good argument there. Yeah, I, I quite agree. And I also think um, a, a kind of a third scenario could well be under circumstances where you've prepared the witness evidence prior to the introduction of this new regime and so have done the kind of proof of evidence in the interview without complying with the practice direction, but will need to sign a witness statement that goes in um, after the 6th of April. Um, so yeah, as Chris said, I think we're, we're looking forward to um, a lot of litigation to, to um, scope out exactly when these, these statements can be varied. I'm going to ask uh, Peter, it was addressed to Natasha, but, so, <laughs> but uh, is it acceptable to show a witness a document you think they will be asked about in cross-examination, even if they did not see it contemporaneously, provided you only show them that document after they have signed their witness statement? Oh, I would have thought that's okay, because you're not doing it for the purpose of, uh, as we're influencing the statement itself. So I think it would be okay. I mean, I, I can see the problem, um, but I think it would be okay to say to the witness, right, well, you've now signed your statement. Um, now we're coming up to trial, and I've got to tell you, there are about 15 documents I wasn't allowed to show you earlier. <laughs> I'm going to show them to you. Uh, and um, what do you say to this law? Because you're going to be asked at trial. Um, now that might be said to be influencing the witness's answers in cross-examination rather than the witness's uh, examination in chief. But I don't, for myself, I don't see why. You can't do that. You always could do that under the old regime. And I would have thought there's no reason why you can't, as long as you're not coaching the witness. I don't see any reason why you can't say to the witness, look, I've got to tell you, you're going to be asked these pretty difficult questions. So have a little think um, a, 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 about what you uh, can recall in relation to these documents. So I think that would be OK. Mm, yeah, uh, for what it's worth. Oh, it's sorry. a question. That <laughs> Sorry for talking of you. Um, no, for what it's worth, I, I completely agree. And I, I think that this practice direction is specifically directed towards producing the witness evidence. Um, before uh, you carry on, I just thought it was, might be worth introducing the next question in the chat into the mix, because I think it relates to similar issues, um, which is how is one meant to balance the obligations of advising a client on disclosure documents received from opponents that might prejudice a client's claim? while not revealing documents to them, which might sway their recollection of events. The two appear irreconcilable, unless the duty of disclosure and the duty to provide witness evidence is reversed. Um, so I don't know if that is something you wanted to speak to, Chris, and then maybe you can come back to Peter. I think Peter's sort of address is in relation to a, a witness, which is to say uh, you can show documents um, to witnesses, provided you're not coaching them. Um, 
provided that's not the same exercise as of assisting with their witness statement. But of course, I think now that this question is being specifically asked about a client, and of course it's incumbent um, on you as the lawyer to put documents and get your client's instructions and to advise them. Um, so that again is very much a separate process. Um, if it's to be done in reality at the same meeting, then there has to be a clear division between when you're taking a client's instructions for documents that have been disclosed by the other side that don't go to, that they can't comment on and giving their own witness evidence for their statement. That is separate to, to taking their specific instructions or advising them on these documents, um, having received them from disclosure. Yeah, all that strikes me as totally unreal. So basically you can get round rules by splitting the meeting up into two meetings. First of all, a meeting about the documents that have been disclosed, or indeed maybe an advice, where you go through all the difficulties of the documents which have been disclosed by the other side, and indeed within your own disclosure. And that's perfectly okay, because you're advising them generally, or advising them on their disclosure obligations. Uh, and so the client then goes away knowing perfectly well what the difficulties in this case are. He comes back the next day to give you his witness statement. Well, true it is, you haven't shown him the documents in the course of taking his statement, but you've shown him the documents beforehand in circumstances where he's bound to remember. And he's bound to have his, well, if, he's got his if, he's got, if he's got a reasonable amount of intelligence, he's bound to be thinking, how do I get round them? But again, I, 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 don't, I don't see how that can possibly be stopped. And I might add, uh, just going back to the old uh, regime, you were always, that was always a, a point which you had in the old regime anyway. Uh, witnesses giving examination in chief always knew of the difficult documents that they might be faced with. So I think that may be another, what you might call flaw uh, in the uh, rules, or at least, not, if not a flaw, um, something which can be fairly easily got round by the dexterous solicitor or advocate, trying to make sure his client comes up to proof. Mm, I mean, yeah, I, I can see that issue. I think we do need to remember that 3.2 of the practice direction um, requires a list to be provided of all documents the witness had reference to when preparing the statement. But I quite agree that when? preparing the statement <laughs> <laughs> exactly is a stretchy term. So oh, we... <laughs> that was um, days before. Exactly. And it goes back to what you were saying in your remarks, Peter, that how, how is this going to be policed? Um, who, who is actually going to be able to prove what a witness did and didn't read um, at any particular time? So it's dependent very much on trust and statements of compliance. Um, okay, is it worth moving on to another question yep. in the chat? Where have I got to? Um, okay, so a question about privilege here. Are the instructions provided by a client and notes from the interview, documents to which privilege does not attach? Is the court proposing to remove privilege? If not, then how will this be policed? Um, well, just one remark I'll make on that before seeing if Chris and Peter have anything to say, but um, paragraph 1.1 of the appendix does specifically state nothing in this appendix removes or limits any privilege that would otherwise attach to documents generated by or for the purpose of obtaining evidence for use in litigation. So that is expressly stated, but I don't know, um, Krista, do you have anything else to, to add to that? I, I don't think I have anything else to add to that, save that um, it, it's not, by virtue of that inclusion, it's not, what's being designed is not to remove privilege. That's not gonna stop people trying. It's not going to stop people trying to see the interview notes, but that you know that that has happened um, for, for quite a long time in respect of this new regime. Um, so there'll definitely be attacks in circumstances where it would appear uh, that this has, for example, been drafted by a lawyer, and that the certificate of compliance um, has been perhaps falsely signed. Um, but that. that in terms of removing privilege, was the, the, the normal principles will still apply. Hmm. Unless Peter has anything else, we'll go on to the next question. No, I have nothing else. <laughs> it's a very active chat box, so I'm going to try and power through some of these. Um, if we don't get the chance to answer any questions, um, I think Chris said, do feel free to email us. Um, it's obviously a big change and there's, there's a, lot that, a lot that needs to be ironed out um, and uh, discussion can keep on being had. Um, okay, council has just drafted me a witness statement in support of an application for summary judgment and has told me that this needs to comply with the new rules as the hearing could result in a final determination of the case. It's proved to be quite difficult because you need to explain the basis of the application. Do you agree? Um, 
well, I mean, my short answer is yes, that's a very difficult situation. It's precisely one of these that might not have been thought through completely by the drafters of the um, practice direction. Um, and, and that is a, an application where there is a lot of procedure that needs to be set out um, and um, would typically be akin to an interim application in lots of ways. Um, but I don't know if, Peter, did you have anything to add? But is that, is that, a, 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 is that a, a statement in support of an application for summary judgment? For summary judgment, Does yeah. Does that come within the rules? I would have thought that would be okay. I thought the rule, I have to check. I thought the yeah. rules basically said it's, for, it's trial with the statements. Yeah. And I agree there may be a bit of latitude there, but I would have thought a statement saying I'm owed 400,000 uh, pounds with the sort of, which might well be fairly argumentative, because it's attaching documents and things. I would have thought if it's in support of summary judgment, that would be okay. Yes. Uh, I, sorry. I think the fact that a summary judgment may be the final uh, nail in the coffin or the end of the case, and therefore constitute <laughs> the final hearing, that's clearly not what's envisaged by the meaning of final hearing. It's supposed to be a trial. And of course, as we know, summary judgment application shouldn't be mini trials. So with respect to, to, to counsel, I, I think we disagree on that. Um, to the extent to which it's possible for a lot of these principles to be put into witness statements in support of applications, they should be, but clearly there's going to be a difference. And so they don't apply uh, to witness statements prepared for applications um, until, until the rules change. Mm. There, is, there is scope for ambiguity there, though, in the definition of the practice direction. So I can see, see why that was suggested. Um, okay. Uh, I find a lot of the work I do on witness statements consists of rearranging points into a coherent structure that provides ease of reading for all parties in the courts, but does involve a lot of editing. Any thoughts? Well, it's this, what does it mean by putting in structure uh, to witness statements? And I would say the question asked is about a coherent structure. Um, I think that's that's permissible and um, clearly wi all witnesses can't be expected, particularly if they've never had experience of, of being in court and making witness statements before, as to knowing what the format is. But again, it's another grey area as to when does putting something in a into a coherent structure then constitute uh, putting words into a witness's mouth. Well, I, th I think putting into coherent structure is, is on the permissible end of that spectrum. And that may require a fair bit of editing. It obviously depends on the length and complexity of the witness statement. Um, but I think what it the rules do is front load the importance of the interview so that you're asking questions in a non-leading open questions, getting as much of it in the structure that you want or that is the witness statement should be so there's not that much editing once the interview is done. Now, except that's a council perfection, but that's, I think, what the, the rules are designed to do. Is there anything? It doesn't seem to me to be totally clear, though. I mean, what if you have, let's say, you've got a lot of notes, and you decide that a lot of these, uh, uh, let's say, two-thirds of it is jolly helpful stuff, and we can rearrange that. One-third of it's not so totally helpful, but maybe we can treat that as irrelevant, so knock it out. Not quite sure what you're supposed to do if that's the case. Well, as I say, there's there's plenty of grey areas here that we'll be talking about long long after this um, seminar. Mm. Yes. Natasha, are there any further yeah, questions? There are, well, there are a number of further questions. Not, as I said, do you be um, I'll, I'll go, go to this one. Um, uh, addressed particularly to Peter, uh, as someone who sits as a judge, do you think you will be able to spot statements that do and don't comply? Yes, is the answer. I mean, uh, it, normally the statements that do comply or well, have complied with the rules in the past. That, well, that is to say the rules about uh, not referring to documents. They're easy to spot. I suppose what might not be quite so easy to spot is uh, whether um, what you might call all the internal compliance rules have been uh, complied with. Um, that, I think, will be rather difficult, frankly. Um, because a lot you'll have to take a lot on trust, and I think you'll only really be able to spot it at the end of the day after cross examination. I suppose there is one thing which I've always uh, found with myself is um, you can normally spot if a, a statement has been beautifully drafted by counsel, 
all the solicitors. And actually, that's a bad thing. And I sometimes think of a witness statement, which is sort of maybe a little bit uh, incoherent, or at least uh, it's got bad grammar and things like that. I tend to think it's a good idea to leave that in, <laughs> even if, in fact, uh, there has been quite a lot of art behind the creation of the statement. So I think in answer to the question, I don't think it's going to be possible to tell just uh, from a statement itself, whether it's been over or whether the rules have been, uh, as it were, behind the scenes uh, complied with. And I'm afraid it'll just have to be a matter for cross-examination. I think the next question is actually quite useful to, to, to on what Peter's just said, because it says, as a matter of practical drafting, does any assertion or statement need to be preempted or qualified by, I recall this because I have direct memory, or some qualification is to diminish recollection? Presumably, Peter, you would say that that smacks a bit of lawyering um, to have those sort of phrases in. Well, you're supposed to say how well you remember things, um, or at least on central points. But I would have thought that would be okay. And I mean, people do do so. I mean, normal non-lawyers do go around saying, I recall. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I agree. I think, I, I think just that the word, as I think that the, the best advice would be just put it in as much as possible, the witness's own words, but there will be some formal things which we all understand. A witness will, um, will, will obviously, uh, it, it won't be held against the witness. For instance, he might start a sentence saying, as to the allegation that I was there on the 5th of December, I completely deny that. Now, that may well be um, something which uh, has been stuck in by the lawyers, but I think you'd be entitled to say, as to this, as to that. Uh, so as to give some sort of sense of what you're about to talk uh, to talk about. Mm -hmm. Just just also on that question, um, because it asks as a matter of practical drafting, I think unfortunately it would depend very much on the circumstances and the particular statement. I mean, if you've got a witness who's recalling everything from memory, then um, it, it maybe is fine to state that um, broadly. But it, if you've got a, a different kind of basis for recollections throughout, then um, then you might want to be more specific. So um, again, as long as as, you, as long as you're explaining um, why why you recall what you do for the purposes of meeting the rules, then I I don't think there's a specific requirement as to how it's drafted. Right, we've got one minute left, so let's try and do maybe two questions. And I think we unfortunately are going to have to uh, message people um, the questions we don't get to. But I think one that we haven't perhaps addressed yet is: Does the rule mean that a witness cannot comment on a document produced by the other side? if he did not see it at the time, for example, as an extreme, a document purportedly from him, but is not. But I think I can probably take this quite quickly, which is if it is being alleged and should start from the pleadings, being alleged that it's a document um, that was him and instructions are it was not, then that is, will be commenting on the authenticity of the document, which is one of the exemptions as to when you can specifically rely on documents. So it is perfectly permissible, and it would be mad not to, to say, I've been shown this document, and it is not a document I have drafted or, um, or the like. So I think that they're specifically uh, included as being something that can be done in under the under the new rules. Mm. I'm conscious that we've hit the witching hour. Um, and I, I doubt people want to be held here any longer than necessary. Um, and if we had just one question left in the chat, I'd suggest we answer it. But I think there, there are still quite a number that are pouring through. Um, so I wonder if it's worth taking any remaining conversation offline and um, thanking you for attending today. Thank you very much, guys, for attending. We'll, we'll try and uh, hopefully get in contact with people who've asked the questions. But if you, if you feel like the question hasn't been answered, or you think of another question after this, then I so said, please do get in contact uh, with one or all of us. So thank you very much, guys, for attending. As Natasha says, on particular such, such a beautiful day, we've just ran over just by one minute, so we hope you enjoy the rest of it.